All right, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I hope you'll humor me for sort of holding my iPad here. I'm dealing with some jet lag, um, so <laughs> I want to make sure I talk coherently. So my name is Martin Wood. Um, this is my colleague, Roxanne Moritidis, and we want to talk to you about um, the Plaid Journal and also what Florida State University is doing to um, support open access, um, promote scholarly publishing, and um, also to combat some of the uh, industry pressure of the academic publishing. Um, so in the next few minutes, um, we'll, be able, we'll build a case for some of the systematic changes that need to be made in the publishing life cycle um, and show you what we're doing to combat those. So this is from the Library Journal Periodical Price Survey in 2019. So this is showing you the average costs of journals um, in the various disciplines. Um, you can see in chemistry, the average cost is right near 6,000. This is in US dollars. Um, in general sciences, the average cost is 2,000. What's important to know about that is that is the average cost. That means there are many journals who are not charging anything that are included in this count, bringing that average down. And there are also many journals who are charging much, much more that are bringing those costs up. It's those journals that are charging much more that are the top tier journals in their fields. Those are the ones considered for promotion and tenure and those sort of purposes. So those are the ones that are the very well known and heavily published and heavily marketed journals. Um, so th there's a case for open access and I don't think there's anyone in this room who doesn't have to make that case over and over and over. Um, at your institutions and in your organizations. Um, so researchers, they need to be recognized in their fields. No one will deny that. Um, it's for the future of their own research initiatives um, to support often antiquated promotion and tenure requirements and processes for funding mechanisms um, and restrictive collaboration opportunities with peer researchers. Um, if you're not well published, it's hard to find peers who want to do work with you. Um, and the academic publishing machine, if you will, is structured in such a way that it benefits the top performers, the ones that have been doing this routinely. And junior researchers have a really hard time breaking into the, the publishing arena and getting their work in recognizable places as recognizable is defined. Um, I am the director of the medical library at Florida State University. So I do a lot of the collection development and deal with all of the budgeting for the library. And one thing I see, and as a librarian can say, we are both part of the problem and the solution. Um, Academic libraries especially, and that's really where I'm speaking from the perspective of an academic library, is we're, requ we're required to subscribe to many of these top tier expensive journals. That's to recruit students, that's to retain students and faculty researchers, and that's also what Catherine Miller just said in the keynote, is to make sure that our academic rankings stay high enough. It's part of the rubric that we're judged against, um, and arguably unfairly so. So library funding is a mixture of decreasing flat and inflation-only adjusted budgets. That is, that is really what pr most libraries are funded. Either their, their collections are always in demand with lower and lower amounts of money available to them, um, or if they do get an increase, it's just to cover the increases in costs. Um, it's not really a budget increase. So what they have to do is they have to, every year, right size their budget and balance the things that they need for, to support their stakeholders, plus the things that we as libraries need to subscribe to to further the future of research and future topics. 
Libraries, it's no secret, come in a variety of sizes, shapes, and few, if any, have the budget to buy every single thing that they need to support all of their stakeholders. Um, year after year, libraries maintain a wish list of things that they wish they could add to their collections if and when budgets permit. Usually the only time a budget permits that to happen is if a library breaks away from a prior and large financial commitment. Something we often forget too, as librarians, is that these resources are not for us. They are not the library's resources. They are the resources for our students, for our professors, for our faculty, our clinicians, our scientists, our historians, our policy makers. Those are the people that a library collection benefits. It does not benefit the library itself. Yet, who is looked at to provide those resources? It's not the stakeholders, it is the library. The library is part of that academic publishing system um, benefiting a large and diverse customer base. So at Florida State University, we, um, the, the Florida State University College of Medicine and the Charlotte Edwards McGuire Medical Library partnered together. The, the mission of the FSU College of Med Medicine is to um, create exemplary physicians, develop an advanced knowledge, and to support underprivileged and underserved populations. Well, that's a very broad category because an underprivileged or an underserved population can be anybody in the right circumstances. So what we did at, um, in the medical library is we wanted to really apply what we know about the academic publishing process um, toward a solution that benefits the most underprivileged and underserved member of the population that the College of Medicine serves, and that's patients. Um, unlike academic institutions, patients cannot afford memberships to scholarly publications. They simply can't. Um, they don't have easy access to university publications uh, because they're not a member of the university family. And they typically don't get new information from healthcare professionals unless it's deemed relevant to their healthcare situation. Um, and so it keeps patients away from, frankly, the research that is meant to benefit them in the long term. This is what the, uh, the traditional publishing model looks like um, from a patient perspective. Researchers submit their work. It goes, um, it's, it has limited access because it's published in one of these subscription restricted model uh, publications. And healthcare team members may have access to it. A lot of times all they get access to is the abstracts, so they're having to dig a little deeper. Um, and the summaries of that research, which may or may not be accurate, are eventually trickled down to the patient if it benefits their healthcare situation. This is the model that we adopted with the Plaid Journal. So the Plaid Journal, um, it stands for People Living With and Inspired by Diabetes. Um, the idea was to bring a group of people together um, who were all touched by diabetes and applied this model. So researchers submit their work to open access journals it is published. Here in the middle, everyone has access. The researchers, the physicians, the clinicians, the nurses, and the patients and the family who lives with the condition. They're able to read for themselves what this means, and then the research can more quickly uh, move toward adoption and also fine-tuned in the process um, as it repeats in the cycle. So patients can have direct input. So that's what we did with our journal, is we brought these groups together. So you can see where libraries have a component here, that's our role, where academic publishers, um, we support the full progress of the journal from submission to publication, and even sometimes before submission. 
Um, we engage with our researchers and healthcare providers to make connections that in a typical journal is not being done. Um, Roxanne, I'll, I'll show you a great example of that where one of our, our medical students and a practicing physician were able to work together to develop an article that meets the need that was identified by a patient. Um, and that, that to me is just this full circle of where we want to go um, because it brings in the patients and consumers. This is sort of what our network looks like. Um, in, in, in earlier models, you've got your research colleagues, your editorial board members, and experts in the field, and that's about it in a traditional model. Um, and you've got readers in there somewhere. We made sure that we included patient communities and peer support networks where patients are communicating day to day about the conditions where they're living. This is, we focused on diabetes. This is not limited to diabetes. This involves any sort of chronic condition that patients live with day to day. This model does support. With that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Roxanne, who can tell you a little bit about the background of how we got there with the Plaid Journal and, um, and show you some of the examples of what we've done. Okay, so um, starting a new journal has its challenges. Uh, being in the medical field, we often get asked by researchers if we're indexed in PubMed. And PubMed is a major database of biomedical sciences literature. And we're not indexed in PubMed, unfortunately. Um, we are included in the directory of open access journals and we're indexed in Google Scholar, Ulrichs, and the Library of Congress. The next question we get asked by researchers is, what is your journal's impact factor? And we don't have an impact factor, and that's because we're not indexed in Web of Science. And even if we were indexed in Web of Science, it would still take a couple of years to generate that impact factor. Um, peer review has also been a challenge. It's difficult to attract new peer reviewers that will follow through and submit a quality peer review, which is Totally understandable because it takes a lot of time to do that and they don't really get any kind of compensation for that work. It also takes us time to manage the peer review process, which leads me to the next point, which is limited staff and limited time. It takes a lot of time to run a journal and there are only five of us on the editorial team and we're all doing other jobs. The Plaid Journal is not our primary job. So if we're not indexed in PubMed or Web of Science, you, how do we attract new submissions? And so far we've done this by attending diabetes conferences, research networking events, sending targeted emails to researchers. Um, but this is always an ongoing challenge, is getting that new content. The platform has been a challenge. Um, you know, we were using OJS2, and OJS2 has a specific look about it. We wanted to make the journal more attractive, more modern, more like PLOS or eLife. So we spent a considerable amount of time customizing that interface to get it to look the way that we want it to. So here's an, ex here's an example. Um, the Plaid Journal is on the left using OJS2, and we are showing an example of another journal using OJS2 as well. So you can see what we've done. We've tried to add more pictures and summarize the research articles. The idea is just to make the content more approachable to patients and physicians. So even though we've encountered some challenges, we do have several opportunities to help move us forward. Instead of using you know, the impact factor, we're highlighting article level metrics, some of which are pretty impressive, and we're trying to boost these metrics through social media. We also have a partnership with Publons. Publons is a peer review recognition service. So reviewers are able to create a profile in Publons and list all of their peer review contributions. So we help to give our reviewers more credit while at the same time tapping into the Publons peer review network. Uh, we're changing the format. So instead of publishing once or twice a year, we're breaking up the content into 
smaller pieces, we're calling them mini issues, we're able to get those issues out three or four times a year. And this helps us to spread out the workload and increase our publication frequency. We also have a partnership with JDRF. JDRF is a nonprofit organization that funds type 1 diabetes research. And with our partnership, JDRF will promote our journal as an outlet to publish their research. The problem is JDF-funded researchers typically want to publish their research in a more established journal, so this is also a challenge. Um, the platform has given us some opportunities. We've been able to integrate with ORCID and Publons and easily share data between these services. We switched to an online-only format. We used to publish print issues because when we were first getting started, our stakeholders felt like we weren't a real established journal until they could hold like a copy in their hand. But now we've learned that researchers would actually just prefer to access the journal online. <clears throat> we've also embedded video abstracts. So this is an example of what this looks like. We have a researcher summarizing her research article that was published in Plaid in about two minutes. And again, we're trying to make that content more digestible and approachable. So <clears throat> because we are open access, we're able to showcase insights and information that encourages researchers, clinicians, and patients to gain from each of their perspectives. Patients have access to the research, researchers have access to patient perspectives, and together they are able to advocate for things that can benefit patients the most. Mm. Researchers can demonstrate how they are working to understand peer support communities and share their work in a place and in a way that patients can actively engage with the content. This also allows patients to amplify the research that they find most valuable through their own communities. Healthcare professionals have the opportunity to hear directly from patients about what is most important to them. In the diabetes world, patients know more about their unique daily living needs than any clinician possibly could. By featuring the voices of patients alongside researchers and clinicians, every stakeholder is able to learn and apply these perspectives to their daily lives and practice. <clears throat> Plaid Journal is also able to provide helpful guidance for living with diabetes. Concepts such as navigating health insurance coverage, how to treat a low blood sugar, and how to talk about diabetes in professional and social settings are often overlooked in traditional academic publishing. Because diabetes does not discriminate based on age, we are also able to consider important diabetes topics throughout the life course. Give me some water. <laughs> Much of the traditional academic literature focuses on either diabetes in children or diabetes in adults. But few publications have focused on transitions through the life course, such as <clears throat> pediatric to adult care, becoming pregnant while living with diabetes, and being a parent with diabetes. Our open access model allows us to listen to what patients need and connect those needs to researchers who can provide the evidence for systematic changes in standards of care. <clears throat> As Martin mentioned, one of our highest ranked articles provided an opportunity for one of our medical students and a practicing physician to work together to meet a need identified by a patient. Traditional academic publishing cannot accommodate transparency required for such a collaboration. <clears throat> so the Plaid Journal is having a positive impact on those living with diabetes, <clears throat> but the Plaid Journal is just one of the open access initiatives occurring at Florida State University. Um, <clears throat> the College of Medicine hosts another open access journal called HEAL, it's an arts and literature journal and the main university publishes three other open access journals. <clears throat> Not listed here, but we're also um, encouraging the use of open educational resources and open access textbooks as a way to reduce the educational costs for students. <clears throat> we also have an open access fund and we're trying to use this to encourage our faculty and students to publish in open access venues. 
And we typically offer up to $1,500 in open access fees. <clears throat> we have an institutional repository that allows us to archive, preserve, and share the scholarly work of our faculty. And we have an open access policy that requires all of our faculty and students to submit their accepted manuscripts into the repository. It's an opt-out policy, so they're all required to do this, unless they can't for some reason. There's some disagreement with the publisher and they have to fill out a waiver for this. <clears throat> so we're seeing more libraries involved in open access publishing initiatives and we expect this trend to continue. You can see here the results of a survey sent to medical library directors asking them about the types of scholarly communication services their library provides. And as you can see, many libraries are assisting with NIH public access compliance, open access publishing, and research impact analysis. But what's not included in the graph are the discussions that are occurring with the promotion and tenure committees. Librarians are now taking an active role in these discussions and are encouraging researchers to publish in open access venues as an alternative to traditional publication outlets. So we, we hope that by changing the system and rewarding, um, or just <clears throat> rewarding faculty by publishing in open access venues that we're able to make open access to research the default and we believe that this is the next step towards achieving a fully open access future. And with that, I'd like to conclude the presentation. I've uh, listed Mark Bauer. He's the design editor for the Plaid Journal. He couldn't be here today, but he spent a considerable amount of time making Plaid look the way that it does, and we couldn't have done it without him. So thank you for your time. <laughs>